I want to do something a little bit different than uh, presenting a singular book. Uh, although I did choose Nightwatch on purpose amongst the, uh, the collection of, uh, of Discworld novels that Terry Pratchett has written, because uh, as I thought about, well, what makes a book great? Uh, what is a great book as opposed to a merely enjoyable book? Uh, and when I was first approached by this, I thought, ooh, I should do The Martian. I love The Martian. It was an awesome, uh, awesome book. I haven't seen the movie, no. I, I plan to. <laughs> I just haven't yet. Uh, but it was an entertaining book. Uh, it served as a, uh, as a great textbook for a special topics course that my, uh, uh, my colleague uh, Lynn Beatty and I uh, did together looking at a crewed mission to Mars, and, and that was great. Uh, but I think when, when I think, well, was it a great book? I think, did it, did it challenge you in any way? Did it make you uncomfortable in any way? In that uh, maybe the thoughts and feelings and understanding that you had maybe wasn't quite right. Uh, it made you look back and reflect on some of that. The Discworld series, does this. Uh, Terry Pratchett does this uh, quite well. And, and I also want to say that this, this series, The Discworld, and, and also Nightwatch, does something very similar to, uh, to what Kathleen's book, uh, Flatland, does. That it takes us out of our reality into a separate reality from which we can look back and, and understand our own, right? And so this whole world, Discworld, that Pratchett creates, he creates as a tool for kind of exploring our own society and our own, uh, our own folklore. One of the things I love about the original art, uh, unfortunately, if you go find the book now, the artwork is nowhere near as imaginative or, uh, or creative. Uh, this was the original artwork uh, done by uh, Paul Kidby's uh, Paul Kidby's hand, uh, a parody of Rembrandt's Night Watch. And here we have Rembrandt's work on the, uh, on the left and Kidby's work on the, uh, on the right with, uh, of course, primary character Sam Vimes uh, there in the, uh, in the lead. And it's, it's just a, an interesting piece to just kind of sit and explore and, and recognize all the, uh, all the different characters. But Pratchett himself, um, very often is just lumped in as here's a, 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 comedic, uh, a comedic fantasy writer. But he really was a, a lot more. I always thought of Pratchett as a folklorist, uh, someone who studies folklore and then, then writes about it in this very uh, fun and comedic way. Uh, well, up to a point, right? And Night Watch is a book that deviates a little bit from his previous work and it's, it's a lot more serious. Uh, in one way, they, people describe it as darker, but that is something that Pratchett himself has been reluctant to say, uh, in that uh, his understanding of something dark is that uh, you, you have something that starts out bad and just gets, uh, quote, better until it gets worse. And uh, there's no light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, whereas, of course, in Night Watch, you end up uh, with things at least no better than they were uh, in the past, right? Uh, or at least no worse, I should say. And so it's, it's grim, and dealing with grim subjects is not the same as, as, being, as being dark. Uh, but he's also a, 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 an avid uh, science enthusiast, or, or was, I should say. He, he unfortunately passed away, uh, succumbed to uh, Alzheimer's, uh, a stroke. Uh, that was induced from uh, a rare form of Alzheimer's that he had in, uh, 19, or in uh, 2015. Um, but his, uh, his passion for, for not just folklore, but for also science is seen in, in some of his, uh, his outside uh, of writing works that he did. Uh, he was an amateur astronomer. He had an observatory in his backyard. Uh, had, uh, had a passion for astronomy ever since he was a kid. Uh, he was a trustee of the Orangutan uh, Society for in, in the UK, and if you're familiar with the uh, the Discworld series, uh, you understand why he had a passion for for orangutans. Uh, they make wonderful librarians. Um, but uh, it, and he also had uh, 
uh, he had a greenhouse that he kept full of uh, carnivorous plants and uh, had a passion for that as well. Uh, so there's a lot of things that he dabbled in uh, and that he enjoyed and that he brought to his, uh, his novels. He was also incredibly passionate about computers um, and had, uh, he loved tinkering with them uh, and uh, kind of building his, uh, you know, working on his own and, uh, and that's reflected in some of the work of the, uh, of the wizards at Unseen University and the, uh, the thinking engine Hex. Uh, and you see a lot of uh, that influence as well. So it goes beyond what we would typically think of as, as a high fantasy type of, uh, of realm. He also dealt a lot with death. And death was a, uh, was a common character, a, a continuing character throughout all of his works. Uh, death, the personification of death in addition to the, uh, the verb and, and state of being death. Uh, and there was something that he mentioned in one of his early books, Weird Sisters, uh, that after his passing, I think, is, uh, is pretty, pretty poignant. That uh, the span of someone's life, they say, is only the core of their actual <laughs> existence. Or, I'm sorry, not Weird Sisters, that was Reaper Man. Um, and one of the books that I have really enjoyed lately is the science of Discworld. And first of all, Discworld, what this is. Uh, you know, the, the old myth of, the, of a world turtle and, and elephants standing on the turtle and the, di and the world is a flat disk. As scientists, we often ask, why are things the way they are? Right? We think, how do things work? Why is it this way? What Pratchett did is he flipped this around and he asked, well, what if it were otherwise? What if it were a turtle, a, a, a turtle swimming through space carrying a, a, a disc with uh, four elephants standing on its back? Uh, and so that's one of the things that I, that I really enjoy is he asks us, he turns this kind of science question around, why is it this way, instead of uh, coming at it the other way and saying, well, what if it were otherwise? What if it were some different way? What would happen then? And throughout all of his novels, some of them lighter, some of them heavier, he, uh, he, he explores lots of, well, pretty challenging and, and heavy topics. Uh, in Pyramids, he talks about uh, the role of myth and religion and tradition and uh, what roles those play and how those are, are challenged. Uh, equal rights, he looks at the, uh, uh, the fallacy of gender, gender rolled uh, professions. You know, why are only men wizards? Why are only women witches? Why can't you have uh, one be the other? And as I mentioned before, uh, in Reaper Man, he deals with death a lot. He deals with death very frequently and, uh, and very profoundly, I think. And then one of the things that's pretty rare for a fantasy writer is he talks a lot about technology. Uh, in Going Postal, uh, The Truth, where he talks about the printing press, and uh, in newspaper, the advent of, uh, of, a, uh, of a publication, and uh, others making money, the advent of, uh, of printed money. Uh, one of his more recent ones, uh, Racing Steam, the advent of, uh, of steam engines. He looks at those technological developments in this very fantasy world of, of the disc world, and he thinks, well, how does this influence society? How does this p change people's understanding of what normal is? and how rapidly that change happens. I mean, how long ago did we have, uh, did we have smartphones, right? Uh, it's, it's only been, what, a couple of decades that we've had these devices. Now they're ubiquitous, right? And society has changed like that. And so he explores some of those, uh, some of those questions of how, how does technology, the advent of new technology, get absorbed into society and how does that change society? But through it all, it really is about people. And this is true of any profession if we really think carefully about this, even, even science, right? It's about people. And Pratchett understood that. And in all of his books, the focus was not on this overarching epic setting or plot line or something like that. It was always about individual people. Very complex, very original, very unique people. 
Um, but at the same time, also people that are very ordinary and familiar. Uh, the character Sam Vimes that we're going to talk about is a very ordinary person that's finding himself in some cases some very extraordinary situations, right? But as he as he tells his stories, it's always through these uh, through the very focused lens of individual people, not uh, not as the great player looking down on the chessboard, right? And so uh, one of the, uh, and this was a quote from Weird Sisters that I was thinking of, destiny is important, see, but people go the wrong way when they think it controls them. It's the other way around, that people control destiny, destiny doesn't control you. Uh, and again, that plays in, uh, in a lot of his novels, and no more so than here in Discworld or in uh, Nightwatch. And before I start getting into some of the, the themes and plot of Nightwatch, I do want to talk about the people. I'm going to introduce some of these people and how they're, at first on the surface, seem very stereotypical, right? Uh, but as with most of Pratchett's characters, you start digging deeper into it and they're not stereotypical at all. Uh, they're, uh, they're extremely unique. And on the surface, Sam Bimes seems like your typical Dirty Harry character, right? Uh, he's, uh, he's Clint Eastwood in Ankh-Morpork. Pork. Um, in that uh, really fundamentally what he is is he's a good person that understands that right underneath the surface there is a very bad person. And really this, this is all of us, right? This is all of us. We understand that there is always darkness in us. In fact, there's a lot of characters that are like this in, uh, in his books. Granny Weatherwax uh, in the witch's arc of the uh, series. Always a struggling against what she calls the cackling. And so understanding that uh, there is always that inner darkness to try and, try and work against. But at this time in, uh, in Nightwatch, a lot has happened to, uh, to Sam Vimes. He, he starts out at the very beginning in, in the Discworld uh, series of books as uh, captain of the Night Watch. The Night Watch, uh, a, a, a band of misfits, and he amongst them. And the, the rise of he and his, uh, and his uh, watch up through various trials and tribulations, saving the city from uh, incineration, magical annihilation, and all kinds of other uh, sundry problems, uh, civil, uh, civil War in the case of Night Watch. Uh, but he eventually becomes commander of the City Watch and, uh, and Duke of Ankh Morpork, a, a title that he absolutely despises, uh, but will leverage for his own purposes. Uh, most important to him uh, are husband, father to be. Uh, that's what we see develop in, in Night Watch is the birth of his son. And uh, that plays important in, uh, in subsequent novels to come later. Uh, but fundamentally, he's a copper. He's a, he's a policeman, right down to his boots, as, uh, as he would say. Um, but getting at this darkness, there was a, uh, there was a line in, in Night Watch, and I'm trying to remember exactly where this, where this was. Um, I believe this was as they were in the, uh, in the Cable Street uh, watch house down in the, in the torture rooms underneath. And, uh, and he had a, a, a torturer at, uh, at his mercy. And he, he realized what he was about to do. And uh, realized that, no, I didn't think, or that uh, the beast, it, it didn't think, it was dumb. What you were and what you were was not the beast. And that plays again when he starts talking to his younger self. Because uh, this, is, this is one of those weird uh, uh, time travel type of things where you go back and you meet yourself and you have to keep yourself from making all the mistakes that uh, you thought you made in the past. But then there's the city watch. Uh, from left to, uh, left to right, Knobby Knobs, uh, Carrot Iron Fence, and Sam Vimes, and, uh, and uh, Fred Cullen. Uh, and when we first meet them, we find that they're just a keystone cop band of misfits, uh, near do wells uh, that are just set to the night watch to keep them out of the way. And as, as, the, uh, as the series unfolds, 
what you find is this, this group of, uh, of misfits develops into a, a very modern police force and a very diverse police force and that diversity becomes their strength, uh, incorporating uh, all species, all genders, and because of that, they, uh, they really do become a representative of the city. Uh, so it's an interesting transformation process, the, uh, the evolution of the City Watch. Lutze, uh, his first appearance was in The Thief of Time. And again, this is one of those characters where you first meet them, and oh, it's just your, your typical trope, uh, you know, standard kung fu monk type of, type of character. Uh, until you realize that he has an extremely urban flair. Uh, spent time in Ankh-Mor Pork and often quotes uh, The Way of Mrs. Cosmopolite. His, uh, uh, it was a dressmaker there in Ankh -Mor Pork, and he, he wrote down all these weird sayings and he would always preface them. Uh, Is it not written? You don't, you're not always told what goes on? And uh, little quips like that. And of course he knew it was written down because he, he was the one that wrote The Way of Miss Cosmopolite. But it developed into, a, uh, into something where now all the monks from the Hublin come down to, uh, to the city to hear the wisdom, wisdom of uh, Miss Cosmopolite. Uh, and uh, and some, of her, uh, some of her sayings are featured here in Nightwatch. Uh, but he, uh, he really ends up being some blend between uh, this little kung fu monk and James Bond. In fact, the, uh, the gadget person uh, that, uh, that is in, in this book is named Q, right? Q-U uh, in this case, uh, spelled out, but uh, anyway. And then there is uh, Lord Vetinari. He is the uh, patrician of the city, uh, the, uh, the supreme ruler. Uh, and at first, again, you think, okay, supreme ruler, your typical dictator, until you realize as, uh, as you go through the books and especially as you go through Nightwatch, that it's, it's a stereotype turned around where you have a, a, he is the supreme ruler, there's no doubt about that, but he also is a, uh, is a ruler that has a genuine uh, passion and compassion for his, uh, his city and his people. And, uh, and his motto is, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, he just sees the, uh, the city as this machine to keep running, keep running smoothly uh, for the benefit of all. And so a, a strange, complex character. Pratchett likes to play with names. He plays with names a lot. And the names that he often chooses have meaning, and they have importance, and they have power. Uh, John Keel, for example. This name and uh, it was likely uh, uh, that it was chosen because of Robert Peel. Robert Peel wrote, uh, he was basically the, the father of modern policemen, or policing, uh, wrote the nine rules of policing in, in England. We'll look at those uh, a bit more uh, and, in fact, it goes so far that uh, in the book they refer to Sammies. Uh, Sammies are, are recruits that are trained up by Sam Vimes and then hired out uh, or find jobs elsewhere in the surrounding regions. And, uh, and these, these, uh, these cops that are well-trained, well-versed, go out uh, and they're called throughout the region as Sammies. Well, this is very much the way that, uh, that Policemen trained by John or uh, Robert Peel were called Peelers in uh, in Britain as they would go out, and so a lot of uh, a lot of different parallels there. Uh, Mossy Lawn, Dr. Mossy Lawn, uh, whom uh, Bimes actually meets first uh, when he goes back in time to uh, to play the role of John Keel. John Keel and Sam Bimes in this instance are the same person. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, but he meets uh, Dr. Mossy Lawn, and this is, uh, this is very uh, familiar to, or, or uh, like it refers to, Bartholomew Moss, who founded uh, Ireland's first maternity hospital down in, uh, in uh, Dublin. Uh, and it, uh, it's noteworthy that when Sam returns to his own time, 
and his own son is being born with difficulty, uh, it's difficult labor. The person he, that he goes to, that he asks for uh, and seeks out is Dr. Lawn. It's not one of the, uh, it's not one of the regular uh, doctors. And then there's Carcer, which at first is an odd name. But uh, when you think about this name, think about its origins. Of course, its origin really goes back to uh, Roman prison. It was the room in which the, uh, the accused would await their sentencing or their judgment. Uh, it was the top room uh, of a, uh, a two-room uh, two facility where the lower room is where you met your doom. The upper room is where you awaited it. And uh, it's also the root of words such as incarcerate, incarceration. Uh, and he is a right nasty piece of work. Uh, in, in the book itself, uh, they, uh, they make reference to how similar it is to the word canker. Uh, for an ulcerous disease, and uh, it is, it's, an apt, uh, it's an apt description. Uh, I, when, when reading this, I always envisioned Carcer as being uh, Alex from Clockwork Orange. If you've, uh, if you've seen Clockwork Orange, that type of character, no remorse, right? Treats it all as entertainment and as a game. That's how I found uh, the Carcer character. So, the plot line of, of this whole thing, uh, this, uh, to borrow a phrase, wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey stuff. Uh, so, Vimes is chasing Carcer across the rooftops of Hank Moorpork, finds himself on the top of the, uh, the library at Unseen University. And books have power, right? Ask any librarian, they'll tell you books have power. And power concentrated on shells uh, is, uh, is a little tough to manage, and magic floats around a little bit randomly. Uh, and, and during a the thunderstorm, they fall through, and they don't just fall through uh, the ceiling, they fall through space and time and end up uh, back in the bad old days of Ankh Morpork. Uh, this is not a new trick, right? This is an old, old trick. Uh, Star Trek, of course, uses this time trick a lot. Uh, but this is a trick that is extremely well executed. I think this is one that's extremely well executed. Um, and, you know, there's this question, well, what would you do if, uh, if you were able to confront your younger self? You go back in time, you meet your younger self, what would you do? I'd probably smack myself around a little bit, tell me not to make some, uh, some damn fool errors that I did before. But uh, it's, it's always an interesting question. And it's interesting how Sam treats this. And then, well, how resilient is history really? Um, you know, we think, okay, if you go back and you change one little thing, right? Does that change the course of all history, right? You know, you go back, uh, you go back 500 years and you step on the wrong ant. Does that mean the different side wins uh, World War II? You know, later on, you know, what, uh, just how much chaos is there to history? But of course, in, uh, in the disc world, we have someone to take care of that. And that's where Lutze comes in, right? The, the monks of history. And they, uh, they say something pretty, or Lutze says something pretty important as he's trying to explain their job in making sure that history happens to, uh, to Sam Vimes. Uh, Vimes says, so you make sure that the good things happen. And Lutze responds, no, Mr. Vimes, the right things. And that's different than the good things, right? The right things are different than the good things. And it sees other little subtle, subtle differences in meaning that, uh, that Pratchett explores that I, that I really enjoy. Um, and, uh, and that leads to one of his famous uh, uh, turns of phrase, the trousers of time, the bifurcation of the universe at, at decision point. So, okay, you come up to a decision point. You're like, all right, am I going to go out to lunch today or am I going to uh, uh, just have what I brought with me in, in the office? Uh, am I going to have the Big Mac or am I going to have the salad? That sort of thing. And at each decision point, there's a, there's a thought in, in uh, quantum mechanics that you split off and there's a multiverse of possibilities, right? There is a universe in which you chose the salad. There's a universe in which you chose the Big Mac. And so maybe that's a bigger universe. I don't know. But uh, he, he comes at this a lot, and, and so 
Vimes wrestles with this because he knows what the present is like. He knows what waits him in the present, right? He has his wife and his, and his new kid on the way. And here he is back in a very familiar setting. He knows what happens because he was there as a, uh, as a young Lance constable. And so he's very familiar with, with what had transpired. And so he's, he's obviously very nervous about doing the wrong thing, right? What if I choose poorly? What if I make the wrong choice? You know, I, cho I choose something different that the John, John Keel that he knew didn't choose, right? And does that suddenly mean I don't exist? Does that suddenly mean that I'm not married, you know, and, and I'm not going to go back to what I think of as a present? The Night Watch never evolved into the robust city watch that it was. And, and so there's always this fear of, of his screwing things up. And going back to, well, just how resilient is history in the first place? But fundamentally, what, uh, what Vimes chooses to do, and, and it's darn good advice, is you do the job that's in front of you, right? So fundamentally, he gets, he gets to the point where he says, all right, this is me. I can't not be me. I'm a policeman. I need to do my job. And here's the job right in front of me. Let's do it. Uh, and that really leads him through. And that's a, uh, uh, that's a theme, again, that you see frequently. You see in the Witches series of books. Uh, one, of, uh, one of Granny Weatherwax's uh, routine things is, well, she doesn't use the phrase, but that's exactly what she does. There's a job that needs doing, and you do it. Uh, and that's exactly what, uh, what Vimes does as well. And one of the lessons that he tries to impart, not just to, uh, uh, not just to uh, himself and to uh, you know, the, other, uh, the others under his, uh, well, not command at that point, but uh, those under him, but especially to his younger self, the young Sam Vines, is the big difference between being a soldier versus being a, uh, a police officer. And this is something that is not, ex uh, is not unique to Nightwatch. He works with this idea, wrestles with this idea throughout the entire uh, Discworld series, even starting with Guards, Guards, the very first novel where we, uh, where we see the Nightwatch. Uh, and it goes back to Robert Peel's uh, Principles of Policing, and that, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the one thing that he tells Sam as Young Sam, as he's wrestling, they're, they're on the barricades, and they know they have these orders, and, uh, and he's wondering what to do. You know, here he has uh, his, uh, his sergeant, uh, doesn't realize that it's himself, but uh, John Keel, uh, basically telling him to disobey the, uh, the orders of, uh, of the patrician and realizing you're, not an officer, you're an officer of the law, not a soldier of the government. That is, uh, your oath is to uphold the law, not an oath to uh, fealty to a particular person. And of course, we see these, this in our own oaths uh, of office as well, right? They're usually to, to the duty to, to the Constitution, not to, uh, not to a person. And uh, the uh, the other thing, and this came from a, uh, a, later, uh, a later novel called Snuff. Uh, the, uh, and this is a, uh, a line that you see bandied around a lot uh, recently. Uh, that uh, <clears throat> in referencing uh, uh, thinking, policemen thinking of themselves as not civilians but separate, uh, that it was a, a dangerous habit. Once a policeman stops being civilians, the only other thing they could be was soldiers. And the reason Pratchett comes back and, and wrestles with this idea a lot is because we see this uh, frequently throughout British history. Uh, a lot of people have looked at the events of Night Watch and have likened it a lot to, uh, to Bloody Sunday in 1972, where the, uh, the British military were called in to support the civil authority in Derry. And it, uh, well, it did turn bloody. Uh, the 1st Battalion Paramilitary, or 1st uh, Battalion uh, Paratroopers uh, 
came in and, well, they're soldiers, right? They're not, they're not, uh, they're not cops, they're not police officers. And so they handled the, the situation like soldiers, uh, viewing, viewing the, uh, the protesters as, uh, as the enemy, as opposed to people that needed to be protected, perhaps from themselves. But <clears throat> the, uh, that link, although it's, it's talked about frequently as you, as, uh, as you look at the discussions about Nightwatch, it was never confirmed by Pratchett. Uh, but one that was, was the, uh, the Dolly Sisters massacre that he mentions. Uh, and when, when hearing about that, Vimes mentions, well, the, uh, the riot wasn't over the price of bread. The protest was over the price of bread. The riot was what happened when you had a bunch of idiots on horseback on one side and a bunch of other idiots on the other shouting, yeah, right, and you had all the people caught in the middle. Uh, this was based on a, uh, on a real event and one that, uh, that Pratchett had mentioned. Uh, and if I uh, get the name, the, whoops, the uh, Peterloo Massacre. That was about the price of bread, uh, the Corn Laws, and a protest to repeal that. And so, uh, and I'm not trying to say I have answers to this or one way or the other, but again, it's one of those things that I think a great book should do, is it should make you uncomfortable. Right? It should make you wrestle with some, with some challenging ideas. And I think, uh, I think this book does that. So in the end, the, uh, the revolution comes again. And uh, in talking to Red Shoe, one of the revolutionaries, uh, I, uh, I really like this. Uh, but here's some advice, boy. Don't put your trust in revolutions. They always come around again. That's why they called revolutions. And, uh, and this is, uh, uh, Red Shoe is a, uh, is your typical filled with uh, uh, high ideals revolutionary and uh, hoping for a better day forward and, and all that. And Vimes, uh, of course, is very, uh, uh, very seasoned in the ways of, in which the world really works and, uh, and understands it's just going to come around again. Uh, people had great faith in the past patrician. They had great faith in this one. He'll go away too. Uh, and the, uh, he also loves butchering uh, the Latin language <laughs> and completely misusing it and creating, uh, creating sentences that are absolutely inaccurate in every conceivable way except in their truth. Uh, and uh, Mr. Slant, a, uh, a, uh, a zombie and lawyer, uh, uh, uses the, uh, the phrase bossa nova similis bossa seneca, uh, a, uh, a twist on a, uh, an old uh, Latin phrase, uh, basically uh, loosely translated, I use air quotes, uh, here comes the new boss, same as the old boss. Uh, and so again, coming back to Vime's comment about, uh, about revolutions. And he had a very pragmatic way of, uh, of thinking about this as uh, the Republic of Treacle Mine Road was trying to take form and Red Shoe was thinking about all the things that the people wanted, uh, freedom, uh, truth, justice, uh, and uh, uh, reasonably priced love was the, uh, was the demand made by the, uh, the Guild of Seamstresses, Ladies of Negotiable Affection. Uh, they made sure that was in there. Uh, Vimes replied, I'd just like a hard-boiled egg. Uh, and that uh, understanding that uh, tomorrow the sun will come up again. I'm pretty sure that whatever happens, we won't have found freedom. There won't be a whole lot of justice, and I'm damn sure we won't have found truth. But it's just possible. I might get a hard-boiled egg. Uh, so Night Watch is one of the more grim stories in the disc world. Uh, it, uh, it deals with uh, some darker themes, but uh, all the books deal with uh, some pretty, pretty meaningful themes. You know, throughout, uh, throughout the entire series, uh, he's always wrestling with one aspect of society or exploring one particular bit of folklore or another. And it's interesting to step outside of our reality into a new and different and fanciful reality, but still look back and kind of study our own.
So that's it. Yes. How difficult is it to start this series in the middle? It isn't. And this is the wonderful thing about the series uh, and why I didn't mind picking up right with Nightwatch. Mm -hmm. um, all the books you can read in individually, in encapsulation. Uh, there is an overall story that develops as you read the entire series. Um, and in fact, very often I hear people say the, the first two, as Pratch is really getting his legs under him, uh, hundreds and hundreds of tiny legs in the case of the luggage, uh, but as he's really kind of getting the, uh, the disc world sorted out and its society sorted out, um, those play more as the traditional comedic high fantasy type of things. Um, and it's equal rights, the third one, where he really starts to grapple very strongly with, with some issues. But you can pick up any one of them and enjoy it. And in this world, do all the people in it believe that the world is a disc? Yes. Well, no. no. Uh, so, okay, and he plays with that too, right? Uh, so what would the analog of a Flatlander be here? Uh, you know, so, you know, here, you know, we, we understand that the world is a sphere. I mean, we have photos, right? <laughs> we, have, we have satellites, people who have flown all the way around it, do so once every 90, 90 minutes in the International Space Station. And, <clears throat> but still you have people uh, insistent that the world is flat. And so what would that be like there? You know, what would a round worlder be that the world is spherical? And there is a couple characters, and he plays with that a little bit. Um, but in the science of the disc world, um, he, he goes one step further, and he asks this question, well, what if it were otherwise? Uh, so you have the wizards of Unseen University. Uh, they, they decide to create a, uh, a, a, a simulation, uh, a universe in which a world is round, and explore, well, what would, the, what would magic be like? What would the rules be like for such a, a, a strange and weird uh, place that, uh, where there is no turtle, you know, so uh, he does play with that a little bit. Any others? Yeah. So, um, outside of the Disc World series, what would you say is actually your favorite Terry Patchett novel? Um, the only other uh, outside of Disc World that I've read is the Truckers. Uh, and that was a very good trio of books as well. So, okay, I have not, I don't think I've read that one yet. Okay. Now I think Strata is, no. Yeah. No, so yeah, I guess Truckers is the You really get a sense of his tongue in cheek. Yes. Uh, writing style. I've almost finished reading Nightwatch, and I've been introduced to this genre by one of my students. Yeah. He encouraged me to read Neil Gaiman. So I just finished reading, before this one, American Gods. And I found that to be an amazing book. And not so much, well, not nearly as fantasy like as this book, but dealt with many of the same themes. I was. I was very surprised at how these books are. Well, they've collaborated. Yeah, that's what your own is. Oh, okay. That's that's a collaboration. Yeah. So. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you.